Um, I now want to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Beth McGlynn. Beth is the past chair of the ABIM Foundation Board of Trustees. Her day job, she is vice president of Kaiser Permanente Research, as well as being interim senior associate dean for research and scholarship and a professor at the new Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. Beth, over to you. Thanks, Jackie, um, and I'm delighted to be here today and to be joined by um, three wonderful panelists who will bring the, the Thunder perspective. Um, they, um, it, you will find information on the app about the specific areas in which their various um, organizations work. Um, and, uh, but what we've asked them to do today is to highlight some of the promising areas for the groups that were working yesterday to build on, and some of the areas that might require greater clarity from a funder perspective. Um, we asked each of the funders to make the, the prospects manageable, to just look at three to four proposals. And we're particularly interested in drawing out kind of general or cross-cutting themes um, that they, uh, that you all might build on as you go into the second round of trying to um, look at these proposals. Uh, for example, when I looked at all of them yesterday, there were common themes about the need for data and measures and um, infrastructure and new ways of looking at the workforce. So um, lots of themes that we, I think, could uh, draw on. Um, so let me introduce them and then turn to questions. And this will be sort of lightning round as with all things in the virtual world that uh, we're doing um, speed dating with funders. So um, Holly Humphrey is the president of the Josiah Macy Foundation and the former Dean for Medical Education at the University of Chicago. Um, she's also uh, past chair of both the ABIM and the ABIM Foundation. Nathan Stinson is the director of the Division of Scientific Programs at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. He previously served as director of the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Lori Zephyrin is vice president, healthcare delivery system reform at the Commonwealth Fund, where she leads the vulnerable populations portfolio. She previously served in a series of senior posts at the Department of Veteran Affairs. So, um, I'm going to start with Holly. Um, you were asked to take a closer look at the work of the groups on repairing the medical education pipeline, uh, virtual reality training for faculty and students of all ages, and community review boards for research. As a funder, did you see any common themes um, in these proposals or anything that you um, wished that they would focus on a bit more when they um, have a second round at their ideas? Ah, thanks, Beth. I actually um, loved uh, these proposals, and I loved them specifically um, because of the beautiful context that David Williams had um, laid out for us. And I would say there are two themes that came up from David Williams's um, presentation that uh, directly relate to these three proposals. One theme was um, David's framing around community immunity. How do we do that? How do we um, make our communities immune? We do that by creating communities of opportunity. And I think the proposal um, that Monica Lipson's group is working on related to building a pipeline is a huge part of creating communities of opportunity. And she and her colleagues, I think, were very um, not only thoughtful, but in fact bold by saying that um, if we're going to have a meaningful pipeline, it, we have to look at the whole thing from K-12 all the way through health professions education, including through faculty who will become the next generation of teachers. So that is bold. I think um, there's a lot more I could say about the pipeline specifically that we've had as a country, a lot of fits and starts. And um, it would be wonderful if we could see real uptake. Now, here's an opportunity for the ABIM Foundation Forum. And the opportunity is that we have among us someone who I did not previously know named Al Richmond. And Al Richmond um, led the group um, on the community academic partnerships. 
And that group, as I understand it, um, was originally set up to really serve as um, a, a review board for research that um, is going on in the community. But, and I want them to do that and they've established a beautiful track record. But one possibility is that um, if we're gonna really build a pipeline that's durable over generations, I think we have a lot to learn from Al Richmond's group who have been working in the community and in academic settings. So those two groups, I think, have some definite overlap. The second theme I wanna mention is the theme, once again, that David Williams teed up for us, and that theme was closing the empathy gap. And I think every one of us was deeply touched when we learned from David that we have a worldwide problem with in-group racial bias, and that by age five, um, the children are open and not biased, but by age seven, it's starting to set in, and by age 10, it's pretty um, set in. So we had um, the chance to think uh, very boldly with um, Rob Wa Roswell, um, who has used some novel technology, specifically virtual reality, to explore racism. And he's done that with his faculty in the Northwell Health System. And um, there is a lot I could say about that, but this is a project that aims to close the empathy gap. I love the fact that um, he started with faculty, but the bold idea is to um, include virtual reality training to explore racism for students, residents, graduate students, faculty, and we had the great benefit of having in the group a pediatrician who said, just wait, why are we just focusing on the health professionals? Shouldn't we actually take this to the elementary schools because of all that in-group bias that we learned about from David Williams? So there's a bold idea, let's train the whole country. <laughs> um, so I, I'm all for that. I think we um, explored some terrific themes. I have a lot more to say, but I know we have other panelists. So Beth, I'm happy to answer additional questions, but let me just stop and see if you have some follow-up. So I have so many uh, follow-up questions, but I want to make sure I get through everybody's original observations, and then we'll see if we have time to um, loop back around. Um, so Nathan, uh, you looked at um, the proposals that related to uh, addressing in inequities in mental health, uh, vaccine hesitancy, rural tribal partnerships, and inequities in nursing home care. Um, each of these groups took on ideas related to vulnerable populations and examined opportunities related to the workforce and partnerships. Did anything in particular stand out to you about these proposals for them to build on? Thank you uh, very much. There, there were a couple of things uh, that really uh, uh, stood out uh, in, in those discussions. And I, I, I have to say it, it dovetails uh, very well with the uh, uh, incredible uh, uh, discussion or lecture we just had from Kellen, who I had the honor to meet uh, many years ago when uh, um, uh, our institute was really uh, in discussions about broadening out, you know, who NIH considers as a health disparities, uh, you know, population. And, and one of the things that really struck me about um, uh, the bold ideas uh, was really the importance uh, of respect for the community. And, and it really uh, brought me back to where I really started my career out on the uh, Navajo Reservation, uh, where um, uh, the problems with, um, uh, automobile injuries uh, were just were, were rampant. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that, um, you know, uh, pickup trucks are, are utilized and there are not a lot of, uh, you know, more than uh, a couple of people uh, often ride in them. Uh, and that we were seeing a lot of injuries among kids, you know, who weren't restrained, you know, in, uh, in automobiles. And part of that related to the fact that uh, where I worked on Navajo Reservation was still very traditional. It was a place called Chinle, right in the center. And a lot of the families carried the, the children on, on cradle boards, uh, wrapped in, um, you know, uh, native uh, materials. You can't put a cradle board in, um, you know, a seatbelt. Uh, even though all uh, women were given um, uh, car seats when they, you know, uh, left the hospital, 
they weren't being really utilized. And it, it was very perplexing, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to many of us. And then there was a group, I think it was at the University of um, Michigan or Minnesota, but they actually had a novel idea. They decided to convene um, a, a group of, uh, um, of Navajo women and discuss this whole issue. And what they found out was uh, that it was very, very important from a, a cultural point of view to have the babies uh, swaddled in the traditional materials. And so these um, incredibly um, um, smart uh, you know, women uh, had a, a great idea. Uh, let's make slip covers for car seats that are made with the traditional materials. And so if you put an infant in the car seat, they still would be swaddled in that materials. Uh, and they did that and, and, and the studies showed that the injuries uh, and death rates of uh, infants on Navajo reservation uh, had a su substantial you know, um, uh, decrease. So my whole point around this is uh, we have to learn how to respect the genius of the local community. There are people out there in communities, you know, just as Kellen said, they know better than we know about what's important to us and what we need from, from a health perspective. And they may not have all the degrees behind the names that we have, but we need to respect that and we need to, to listen to that and to make sure that when we think about, you know, the health conditions out there in rural and tribal communities, when we think about how are we going to address this incredible mental health, you know, um, struggle that we're all going through right now, um, you know, with this COVID-19, that we listen to the voices out in the community and that they are really real partners in determining what are the right things to do. Thanks so much. I think so for both of you, this uh, engagement of the community and listening to the community is, uh, you know, a critically important factor that we'd like all the groups to um, build on. So, Lori, um, you looked at the proposals on maternity care, uh, primary care strategies, primary care global contracting, and the role that health insurance companies can play in laying, laying the foundations for trust in um, what we hope ultimately is an effective and safe COVID vaccine. Um, you know, a lot of focus across these proposals on the primary care system and on appropriate financing uh, for it. Were there any areas that you thought needed greater clarity or that particularly stood out as things to build on? You know, just really, um, um, I just want to say, you know, congratulations to to all the, the teams that put this together. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to review Don, Lloyd's, Dana's, and um, and my proposal, I was very impressed. Some of the cross-cutting themes I would say is, you know, it's really about reimagining health, health systems and the opportunities for payers, communities, and health systems in, together in advancing health equity. Um, a really uh, uni universal theme was, was also around community, but also around partnership and data and accountability. Um, Don's the sort of bold and actionable idea was really focusing in on, you know, how do we engage communities? How do we, um, how do we essentially, um, you know, ensure that um, we have community and health system partnerships in addressing maternity care and really integrating respectful care? And those themes were reiterated in, in the other proposals as well. Um, for the primary care strategies for, for Lloyd, you know, the role of community health workers in communities, it really stood out as critical. That's something that we're focusing in on at the Commonwealth Fund as well. Primary health care is really centered on the role of community and what we've learned from models of primary health care outside of the United States, whether it's Cuba or Costa Rica or other, um, you know, or other, other developed nations, the models of primary care are really centered around the community and engage the community and really engage community health workers as partners. And so really um, the creation of healthy communities is critical and really, <clears throat> really thinking through partnerships to, to, um, that are community led um, to be able to create um, create um, primary care models for how they should be. So community is being a center to primary care models. Um, I also like the, you know, the key piece around, you know, how do we um, pay for health, um, not just health care 
is something that's really critical. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've, um, we funded several work, uh, several, um, several sort of uh, work relating to that at the Commonwealth Fund, you know, and we see that with um, some of the work around um, in North Carolina, when, you know, they're thinking through how do you actually you pay for social, pay for health related social needs and partner with communities. Um, and, um, you know, there are other payers and plans that are also thinking through how do you, um, how do they reimburse for, um, for social needs and partner with community based organizations in doing that. And, you know, North Carolina, their, their model, you know, still has yet to move forward. It was just really an amazing opportunity to bring community-based organizations to the table to really create, you know, a, a fee structure around what it would take for, for Medicaid to pay for social services. And I think that's, you know, at least the, the constructs of that model, you know, can be very valuable and, and useful and also really important. So the, the health systems, partnership, partnering with the payers, partnering with community-based organizations, it's really critical. Um, for, for Mai's work around healthcare insurance's role, very similar in terms of what's the role of payers in actually addressing equity and engaging communities and partnering with communities. It's also, um, it's also very important. Um, and, you know, this work isn't easy because it really involves building trust and really ensuring that community partners are equal partners and that, you know, because health systems and communities typically have not been equal partners, there's a lot of work that goes into that, particularly around building trust. And so we, you know, we also have work <clears throat> that's really thinking through how do you um, engage communities, work with communities to be able to, um, you know, come together with health systems or payers and really thinking through what models of care can, um, can be integrated, how to address health related social needs and how to really, you know, build actionable, actionable partnerships. And so I really, I really like the idea around, you know, building trust for COVID vaccination using the models around, for example, Len Nichols models and Lauren Taylor's model on action model on social determinants of health. Like how do you solve this free rider problem um, where um, who can actually take responsibility for, for paying and reimbursing for these social needs, but also collectively decide on which social needs to address. And I think the idea of adapting that model to addressing trust and um, helping to ensure that communities can, um, can, um, can um, be engaged, particularly when it comes to COVID vaccination, I thought was really creative and, um, you know, should, you know, definitely look to the work that we're doing at the Commonwealth Fund because that work is, is still ongoing around, around, um, around feasibility studies of adapting this model around social determinants of health. So I was really excited about these, these, um, these bold and actionable ideas um, all of them really dovetail very nicely into areas of work that we're already moving forward at the Commonwealth Fund, Fund. and really this idea of building trust and engaging communities and partnering with communities is something where we have a lot of work to do on that. And, and really, I think these bold and actionable ideas will, will definitely help us get there. Thanks. Well, thanks to all of you. And we only have um, a minute left, so I, I fear this isn't quite enough to uh, do another round um, uh, around. But um, I think there were some tremendous themes that one of the things I just wanted to emphasize that we saw in the chat is, um, and I think we know this, but trust can't be built overnight. And um, I think as you think about the different proposals that you all looked at, um, uh, I, I think you likely would be um, less enthusiastic about a proposal that was um, going to leap straight to um, a community without a sort of clear plan for and frankly track record uh, of doing that. So, you know, I think we, you know, we see that um, a lot in the chat and um, and I think as the groups go back, they can think a little bit about what the foundations are that have to be laid um, before you can maybe leap to the, uh, the bold idea. Um, and also, I just want to emphasize, and I think we, you know, we got started uh, from Kellen on this, which is, is just the importance of listening and humility and how much we have to learn um, from the populations that we're, 
you know, trying to serve that have been marginalized for so long. And I think we have just a frightening number of examples of people who've been, uh, you know, left out. And all of these proposals, I think, um, are really trying to do great things, but um, will um, need a lot of foundational uh, work in order to, you know, move the ball forward. 